Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining our webinar on patient protections for the practice of step therapy in Minnesota. My name is Angie Teese, and I'm the State Government Relations Manager for the National Psoriasis Foundation. I'm proud to call Minnesota home and live and work out of White Bear Lake. I am joined by Dan Andreessen from the National Multiple Sclerosis Society and Dr. Douglas Smith from the Minnesota Epilepsy Group. For today's discussion, I will serve as your moderator over the next 45 minutes or so, and they will provide um, content as it relates to both the legislation and the provider experience. I'd like to thank both the Minnesota Epilepsy uh, Foundation or the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota and the National Min uh, Multiple Sclerosis Society for their ongoing collaboration and partnership on not only this legislation, the webinar, but our ongoing efforts to address patient access issues in the state. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available to you following um, today. In addition, CME credit will be offered um, for our providers on the phone and on the web. Um, all participant lines will be muted throughout, so I would ask that if you have a question or comment, please use the chat box function. We will we will pause briefly after each segment uh, to allow for a, a brief uh, Q and A. Julie, if you'll if you will advance uh, the slide to the disclosure slide, please. Um, at this point in time, Dr. Douglas Smith has disclosed that he has a conflict of interest with uh, the Professional Advisory Board uh, as it relates to Zogenix. And next slide, please. So before we get into the legislation and what we work to address, I thought it'd be good just to level set on what is step therapy so we have a working definition, though I suspect many of you have experienced it personally or professionally. Step therapy is the process by which a patient is required to first try and fail on sometimes numerous medications uh, before coverage is granted for the medication that their doctor has originally prescribed. Um, it is a utilization management tool that many insurers employ to uh, contain costs, um, but in many cases it delays access to the medication for that individual and disrupts the patient and provider relationship. Uh, in 2018, um, in the state of Minnesota, uh, the National uh, Psoriasis Foundation, the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, and the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota came together and built out a broad-based coalition to address this legislatively. Um, Dan Andreessen will take us through those legislative changes, um, but first I will introduce Dan. Um, he is the Senior Manager of Advocacy and State Public Policy for the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. He covers the states of Iowa, Minnesota, and Nebraska and proudly calls Minnesota home. Um, he is a graduate of Creighton University in Nebraska and holds graduate degrees from the Michigan Technical College and the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Dan, take it away. Thank you, Angie, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the National Multiple Sclerosis Society has been working on reforming the step therapy process in states across the country with our partners at the National Psoriasis Foundation and the Epilepsy Foundation. Um, and next slide. Um, so we are involved because for those living with MS, being forced to try and fail on an ineffective treatment can mean a difference between disease progression, relapses, worsening disability or facing potential harmful side effects from an ineffective medication. An example comes from Brian Bierbaum, who lives in Eden Prairie and whose struggle with step therapy was featured in several stories aired on WCCO television. He wrote these words in an op-ed published in the Eden Prairie News. Quote, step therapy is a pain, both figuratively and literally. Insurance companies claims it saves them money, but it gives no consideration to the human cost it creates. It started with my doctor telling me that this is that this is a drug I want you to take, but your insurance insists that you try and fail on this other drug first and then another one after that. Finally, they will cover what I want you to have. So I was forced to go through these steps. As the process continued, I got worse. I had three attacks, decreasing my mobility and causing me to miss work and even ended up in the emergency room. Each time this happened, my insurer had to pay the additional care and treatment. That's not good for anyone, let alone someone with a young family, end quote. Unfortunately, the experience faced by Brian happens often for those living with MS and other chronic conditions. However, as Angie mentioned, recent changes in state law will increase the ability of providers to bypass a step therapy requirement when it's in their patient's best interest. 
next slide. In 2018, the legislature unanimously passed a bill to reform the step therapy process used by health plans. The bill, authored by Senator Paul Utke of Park Rapids and Representative Kelly Fenton of Woodbury, was signed into law by Governor Mark Dayton in May of 2018. This new law went into effect on January 1st of this year for all state regulated health plans in the private marketplace. It does not include larger employer plans, which are regulated at the federal level under ERISA. This new law has two parts. The first part requires health plans to consider recognized evidence-based and peer-reviewed clinical practice guidelines when establishing a step therapy. Concerns have been that health plans have solely used the cost of the drug in creating these protocols. Additionally, any criteria used to create a step therapy protocol must be transparent. If any enrollee wishes to know more about the criteria used, a health plan must provide those details. The second part of the law is the exemptions process that a provider can use to request an exemption to a step therapy protocol. The process for requesting an exemption must be easily accessible on a health plan's website and health plan can use their existing prior authorization processes to satisfy these requirements. There are three scenarios a provider can use to request an exemption. The first is the case that a patient could be harmed if forced to try the drug preferred by a health plan. This includes a situation where the medication could worsen the condition for which a drug is seeking to, that a drug is seeking to treat or another medical condition. It would also include a situation where the preferred drug could adversely impact a patient's daily activities. An example is in an airline pilot being forced to try a preferred drug whose side effects include drowsiness. Next slide. Um, the second scenario is a patient has already tried and failed on that preferred medication or a medication that's in the same pharmacological class or with the same method of action. For example, there are several medications to treat MS which are called interferons who act similarly in the body. Under this scenario, if a patient had already tried and failed on an interferon, a provider would, could request an override if that patient had stopped treatment on that interferon due to lack of effectiveness or an adverse event. And the third scenario is when a patient switches to a different health plan who, due to new formulary coverage, could be forced off an existing effective treatment for a drug preferred by the new health plan. A provider could use this exemption if a patient is stable on existing treatment and that change in treatment would cause an adverse effect. After making a request, the health plan must respond to a provider within five calendar days or within 72 hours if it's an emergency request. If the health plan does not respond within these timelines, the override is automatically granted. A couple other items I wanted to note in the law, all override requests must be submitted through the electronic prior authorization process. And any override process request denied by a health plan can be appealed and external review can be requested. The health plan can still require a patient to try a generic form of a medication if it's an equivalent. A provider may not use a pharmaceutical sample to meet the requirements of a step therapy protocol. And granting an override does not bind the health plan to cover a drug that's non-formulary. So in this case, if a provider is seeking to request an exemption to a drug that's not covered by the health plan, the plan is not forced to provide coverage for that medication. And lastly, an update that was just passed by the legislature three weeks ago. Language was included in the Health and Human Services Budget Bill to expand the step therapy law to include the state's Medicaid and fee-for-service plans. This change goes into effect on July 1st when the Department of Human Services requires Medicaid plans to adhere to their new preferred drug list. So going forward, this law will apply to everyone enrolled in a public program or on a private market plan not regulated by ERISA. This new law is a positive step forward to ensure those with complex medical conditions have timely access to life-altering medications. Thank you for joining us today. And with that, I'll turn it back to Angie. At this time, we will take questions um, regarding the legislative changes uh, before we get to the provider uh, perspective. Julia, do we have any questions? 
We do not have any questions at this time, but just a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, you can use the questions box in your control panel to submit it to us. Okay, I will wait for maybe another minute or less. Okay, still no questions? Still no questions, but I will jump back in if there are any. Wonderful. At this time, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Douglas Smith with the Minnesota Epilepsy Group. Um, he uh, will provide a provider perspective of, for this conversation. He is a board certified pediatric epileptologist practicing at the Minnesota Epilepsy Group. He attended medical school at the University of Medicine and, Dentist and Dentistry of New Jersey, New Jersey Medical School. He completed a pediatrics residency at Our Lady of the Lake Regional Medical Center and completed both his pediatric neurology and pediatric epilepsy fellowships at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He specializes in the treatment of rare genetic and neonatal epilepsies. He has been an active advocate at the state capitol on behalf of the Epilepsy Foundation of Minnesota and was instrumental in the passage of the step therapy legislation. Welcome, Dr. Douglas Smith. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Angie. Thanks, Dan. And embarrassingly enough for me, I think I'm wearing the same shirt as I was in that promotional photo that I took three years ago. So what are the odds? Um, thanks, everyone, for, for coming. Um, I, uh, we can advance uh, to the next slide. Um, so I kept my, my, my slide points kind of really basic so uh, I can kind of talk a little bit more casually um, about what we've been experiencing on the front lines. Um, and I wanted to start by kind of emphasizing that we are not opposed um, to uh, efforts to control uh, spending on healthcare. I recognize that on, on paper, um, the idea of step therapy kind of makes sense in, in a certain regard uh, in that there are people who are not intimately familiar with the um, nuances of some of these more new and uh, more expensive medications. And um, because of that, and there's a lot of efforts from these uh, companies to get individuals to use them, I understand that, and that there needs to be some degree of uh, uh, gatekeeping in saying that um, it's not appropriate to start with some of these newer, more expensive medications. Um, the issue that we have been facing is that in order to, to, to really implement um, step therapy, there needs to be a clearly understood and well-defined hierarchy of medications. There needs to be um, clear understanding of the differences in, in either uh, effectiveness and safety between all these medications um, when you're trying to implement them, uh, when you're making that selection for a patient. Unfortunately, I can say for, for epilepsy, um, that hierarchy does not exist. There isn't a clear algorithm to say that uh, we have five equally effective medications. Um, we can't clearly state that, that certain medications will be more effective for, for, medic for certain patients or less safe for certain medications. And unfortunately, a lot of those decisions really need to be made on a patient by patient, on a patient by patient basis. And, um, and I think that was the whole idea of the legislation to say, look, there, this, is, there are, this is a good idea um, and I understand why it makes sense um, but the, this is unfortunately something that can be used uh, and abused. And we certainly have been experiencing before the legislation some of those abuses. Um, for example, what we were experiencing beforehand uh, was that the, the, what they would define as a treatment failure. Um, in our world in pediatrics, uh, the doses that they were offering were quite frankly made no sense. They were essentially adult doses. And I was not meeting those criteria because I wasn't advancing a two-year-old child up to the dose that an adult would be on. And so some of the uh, protections that have now been put in place is to say that, well, if they have uh, achieved this dose or had a dose-limiting side effect, uh, we had caveats where we can say we don't need to go up to the adult dosing. And in some cases, they have now adjusted that to more accurately reflect, reflect what we are uh, doing in the real world. Um, there are uh, numerous, I kind of have a lot of examples of things that the law would have addressed. Um, uh, the one that kind of immediately comes to mind 
uh, is there uh, was a child that I was treating who was seizure free for years on, on a medication that when they had switched uh, coverage to a step therapy based process, they had uh, recommended that they that this child had to come off of uh, this medication that had rendered her seizure free for, for a year and a half. And um, I didn't have any alternative. And so I had to follow the recommendations of medications that had to be changed. And after uh, multiple, after several months of uh, increased seizures, uh, they finally gave us uh, approval to go back on the one that had been working. Um, and with the legislation, uh, at least the way that it has been constructed, um, that we should have been able to avoid the, that process. Unfortunately, this child went through that ordeal uh, short, almost immediately before the law went into effect. Um, the challenges that we are facing in the meantime, though, is that they are, they obviously are, are creating these loopholes, but in order to take advantage of these loopholes, you have to be thoroughly documenting um, exactly what they are looking for. Um, the issue that we have been coming up with, uh, that we have discovered uh, in our office, is that um, number one, surprisingly, uh, one of the loopholes that requires that you're, that, that it's a neurologist prescribing this medication. Um, I am a licensed neurologist in this state, and I'm a certified neurologist, um, and it says Minnesota Epilepsy Group and licensed epileptologist, but it never actually says the word neurologist. And even, uh, and even when we put that I'm a neurologist on their paperwork, it often, they often come back saying, well, are you a neurologist? Um, and so in order to access some of those loopholes, again, certain things that you wouldn't think you need to, to add onto your chart need to be added. Um, additionally, uh, they are becoming more strict in uh, what uh, of, of, of what you include in your note to, to quantify as a um, drug failure. Ordinarily, uh, I contend that information is contained within my uh, history of present illness, where I talk about medications that that child has been on, um, but I don't include the dose uh, necessarily on there because I'm trying to tell a story and I don't include every single detail like that because it renders it unreadable. Um, unfortunately, as this is just part of the evolution of the medical record in that um, they are now wanting that information. And so we have to add that uh, separately in an additional uh, place so that our complex kids wind up having a, a note that is upwards of uh, six to eight pages, um, just because, so we can include every bit of information that is required for these, um, for these overrides. Um, that said, uh, it is again, I don't think uh, that information most of that information would have ordinarily been there. So it's a small increase in the amount of work um, for me personally, but it what turns into a, a significant amount of work ultimately for our support staff or our uh, CNAs that are uh, getting those, um, we're having to complete that paperwork to get these overrides approved. Um, ultimately, I think that it's a, a good idea in principle. Um, and, and I think that having these protections in place are, are absolutely critical for, for any payers that are going to be starting to implement um, these step therapy uh, processes. And I think that um, there's still room to do even better um, for, for certain medications. Um, but ultimately, it's going to be on a case by case basis that we determine that um, same way that, again, we need to address uh, our medication selection on a case by case and epilepsy by epilepsy case. I obviously can't speak as knowledgeably about uh, psoriasis or uh, multiple sclerosis, but I can say for, for absolute certain with epilepsy, um, that decision belongs uh, much more in the hands of, of the providers because um, there's so much more that goes into that decision that just cannot be fully uh, uh, explained or documented. And um, I think that this, this, this uh, legislation has gone in that direction. But ultimately, um, because there's so much money on the line, it winds up being uh, a, a, an administrative whack-a-mole and that once they close this one loophole, they're going to discover another one. And, uh, uh, and we've gone through that process and through enough iterations to discover that they already, they already figured out some, some of the other loopholes we were taking advantage of that they're now closing as well. And, and so ultimately, um, I think that, uh, this is going to be helpful, uh, but, uh, the, our fight is not done. Before we move on to the next question, I want to make sure the next slide. I want to make sure we address a question that did come in. Um, they are asking if we could clarify what happens when the dr a drug that a patient wants to take is not on the formulary, and whether the person still has to go through step therapy, or what happens in that scenario. 
so I think either Dan or Dan or I could could tackle that one. But um, the the law does not uh, necessarily apply to ones that aren't covered. Um, this does it's, this it says that if they uh, are on the formulary that they can require patients to go through steps. Um, there ultimately are still medications that are, we just cannot get covered, uh, no matter how many medications that they are on. And so this doesn't necessarily address that. Dan, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I would agree. It was it was um, just ensuring that um, you know the formulary still stays in place, and so that's what's going to dictate the drug coverage, um, and that you know, even if some uh, provider is wanting to get access to that medication through the step therapy protocol, the formulary coverage would still uh, stay in place. And we actually have another question that's just come in. Um, this person is wondering if there's been any litigation from families that have been adversely affected by step therapy that you know of. Um, I can I can speak from the National Psoriasis Foundation, not not to our knowledge, in the state of Minnesota or elsewhere. Likewise, yeah, none that I know. Of. Okay, that is all we have for questions right now. Next so, slide. Dr. Smith, I will continue with your slides. I don't think this, this one's on my slide. Oh, um, Dr. Smith, if you could detail kind of what the appeals process looks like um, oh, sure. from an administrative perspective. Sure. Um, so, it varies from provider to provider, uh, from payer to payer. Um, generally speaking, what the process ordinarily looks like is that we send our prescription into a pharmacy. Uh, the pharmacy runs it through insurance, and if uh, they deny it or they require a step therapy, that they are supposed to alert uh, both the pharmacy and the ordering physician. Um, that varies, again, exactly how they go through that process um, of alerting us varies. Um, sometimes they send us a letter. Uh, I've been told that sometimes uh, they just enter the patient into this uh, online portal and we're expected to log in and follow up on that ourselves. Um, that again, so it's so it's it's variable. Some uh, programs have their own documentation um, that they expect filled out with their explicit information they're looking for. Um, there's also a third-party web provider, the one that I just mentioned, that lots that multiple different payers use, um, where they expect you to add uh, very specific, detailed uh, information. Um, and then they may or may not request our, our, our notes uh, from the feedback I have heard from our CNA staff is that they are explicitly told, um, even though they ask for essentially 20 or more pages worth of documentation, when they speak to the individuals who, who review it, um, they often tell them that they, they don't read it. Uh, they read essentially a very, very small amount of it, if any. Um, and so uh, it varies. That, that, so that's kind of how the generally how the appeal process uh, looks. Um, and again, it, it varies from 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 place to place. And yeah. Very good. Dan, do you have anything to add from a Department of Commerce? OK, um, it is an internal process that is administered by the Minnesota Department of Commerce. Um, we work with them to ensure that it's being implemented and so following the, the presentation, you will have a survey, and if you are a provider or a patient and you're experiencing frustration um, with that process, you know, we'd like to, we, we make no promises that we can address it, but we would like to know about it um, so that if it seems like it's a reoccurring theme, then uh, we can look at potential remedies. Oh, Angie, um, next, oh, oh go ahead. One thing I would add, with this new change that just passed this last year with the inclusion now of the Medicaid and fee-for-service plans, that any appeal process will be going through the Department of Human Services like has happened in the past for other uh, Medicaid enrollees. So that process would be separate uh, from the Department of Commerce, but it would be the same that um, you've been following in the past if you've done so with a, a Medicaid enrollee. And I think it's also worth, I mean, this isn't specific, obviously, to, to this step therapy program, but um, I think it is a giant problem in our medical system that, uh, again, I noted that it's the pharmacy and us who get notified, often inconsistently, uh, about the denial process. Um, patients, by and large, think that this is 100% that our office is not on top of things. Um, I get calls basically multiple times every weekend uh, saying that, why haven't you sent this in? Why haven't you sent this in? And the answer is always, we did send it in. 
um, we, we send all the information and it's right now in the hands of your, of your uh, insurance company. And even when you explain that, um, it often, I mean, I understand patients are equally frustrated, whereas everybody is frustrated as they are. Um, but because the payer is obviously not notifying them that um, they're seeking extra information, they're not saying that we are the cause of the delay, um, this often gets uh, results in significant um, consternation and frustration, uh, both for patients and, and for providers. Um, but again, that's not specific to this, this step therapy uh, issue. And I think next slide. Dr. Yeah. Smith, do you have any help? Okay, very good. Yeah, so um, I, since I'm not, as I kind of highlighted, uh, those those requests don't directly come back to me. They come back to our uh, CNA staff and uh, they handle just an immense number of these every day. And so uh, when I was picking their brains about, just in general, about the appeals process and, and obviously specific to um, step therapy, uh, just talking about other tricks that could be implemented across uh, other practices. And they just kept uh, emphasizing over and over again how important, consistent, and um, comprehensive uh, documentation makes their jobs uh, so much easier. Um, they, it's often surprising the details that, that, that uh, these companies or are, are, the payers are looking for. And if it's not available in the note, it winds up having to get bumped up a level, which obviously delays things um, often, and it keep, takes uh, much more, much more work on on both fronts. Quite frankly, both for uh, our nursing staff and and for uh, physician providers. Um, the challenge I think that I personally have been facing uh, in doing this is that I, I take great pride in being as as comprehensive as possible in my notes. The problem is, is that uh, the note has gotten quite big, and um, there are multiple times where I'm discussing the exact same thing, and if I update one. Uh, I may miss it in a different place, and having contradictory information often is a result of uh, often results in denials. And um, it is I've been working on my own practice of being better at being uh, consistent at that. Um, but again, as the note size has grown, as our patient complexity grows, uh, that becomes quite difficult. Um, again, something as 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 arbitrary uh, as as specifically indicating in my note that I am a neurologist. Um, it's it's a, a it apparently has slowed down multiple uh, uh, approval processes because uh, most, uh, a lot of the step therapies specifically indicate that a neurologist can only needs to try two medications, uh, whereas a non-neurologist needs to provide uh, three uh, failed medications um, before it'll get approved. Um, and so I think, uh, I, I know that those are, are extremely specific, um, but I, I think the important lesson is that, uh, again, this is this is a bureaucratic whack-a-mole. Whatever it is that's, that's the problem now, it's gonna change. As soon as you fix that problem, something else is going to come up. And this has just been our, our more recent issues uh, that, have, that have emerged. Um, a, a recurrent uh, uh, issue that they have seen is just that, that there has been really no flexibility on the, uh, that you have to try a generic uh, before uh, just uh, demanding a uh, brand name uh, medication. And um, there, there have been multiple attempts uh, to, to stick with a brand name, um, but multiple payers pretty much universally have said they will not uh, entertain that possibility until the generic is at least tried. Um, and so those those are uh, the, what they had highlighted as as current active issues. Although again, this is going to vary across payers, it's going to vary across uh, locations, and it's, I'm sure it's going to vary across uh, specialties. Very good. Thank you for that. At this point, do we have any additional uh, questions? Yes, we do have one question asking um, probably if Dan could just clarify what part of the law goes into effect July 1st of this year as opposed to what was already in effect at the beginning of the year. So right now, uh, what's in effect is that the step therapy applies to everyone on a, on a private insurance plan uh, that's not a RISHA, that's, that's state regulated. So this is, um, you know, it could be a small employer, it could be uh, plans that are on the Minsure Exchange. Um, the July 1st date is when um, those on Medicaid or fee-for-service um, kicks in under this law. And so right now, they're not subject to these step therapy protections, but it, they will here in the next few weeks. There are no other questions at this time. Well, very good. 
Um, well, before I get to the segment about just kind of step therapy across the country and what it looks like from a federal perspective, um, I wanted to thank our panelists uh, for their contributions and to say that each of us and our respective organizations work diligently to ensure and do our best to, to have our patients have access to timely medication that is going to work for them and to restore that patient provider relationship. And so know that we will continue to stay engaged on this issue and other patient access issues as they arise in the state of Minnesota. And as you uh, experience or have um, thoughts about you know, what you're experiencing current, currently, I would encourage you to reach out to your uh, organization and let them know of your frustration so that we can kind of elevate that voice and, and work to provide a remedy wherever it exists. So we um, did just yes. have one more question come in. Um, can you guys speak to uh, what role the Department of Commerce plays in the appeals process? Sure, and Dan, I'll defer to you on that. Um, it's it's very similar to what, what role they currently play with um, insurance appeals um, and, and taking that documentation in. Um, maybe Dr. Smith can probably go into more detail as someone who's actually practice that, but that's going to be the role that they play, uh, which they, they currently have been doing. Dr. Smith, do you have anything to add? Um, I'm not sure I can provide more clarification uh, about their specific role than, okay. than Dan just did. Um, and I guess what I would provide is that um, they provide the oversight and the regulatory oversight over uh, the insurance kind of appeals process. And so Dan and I and um, the Minnesota Epilepsy Foundation met with them uh, prior to the implementation to ensure that there was a seamless process and that the necessary materials and information was available to both um, practitioners, patients, and that um, and the insurers as well, so that there was a streamlined process uh, for patients and providers to access uh, when appealing the decision. Thank are you. there further questions? There are not right now, but as a reminder, you can use the question box if you have any, and we'll come back to questions and answers in just a few minutes. Fantastic. Next slide, please. So uh, step therapy in the United States, as Dan alluded to um, and mentioned, uh, we look at step therapy in kind of three buckets. Um, well, two I'll go over. We have a NERISA, which are uh, federally regulated insurance plans and are um, governed by federal law or congressional. Um, and then we have state regulated insurance products, which are governed by state law. And then we have a hybrid with Medicaid, Medicare, and some public um, insurance uh, products as well. Um, we work at the National Psoriasis Foundation in coalition uh, to address step therapy and, and, and in put in place patient protections at all levels uh, where insurance is regulated. Um, and so uh, through this link, which you will have access to, you can access a map that indicates where uh, step therapy uh, protections are in place for state regulated plans. I believe we are at 22 states um, in the United States so far. And at the close of this session, we should be probably around 25 or 26. Um, Oklahoma, Georgia, um, have just recently passed legislation which will be implemented shortly um, and then Delaware and Maine are um, in the hopper and I think just awaiting a uh, signature by the governor so this is something that is uh, you know going across the country um, and we're working very hard as I said in, in coalition uh, to address it um, the next slide please on a federal level um, again, the, this would uh, regulate the ERISA plans, large insurers, large employers. Um, uh, we have, we are working in coalition and um, have been successful in introducing the Safe Step Act or HR 2279 in the United States House of Representatives. Um, this very similarly to Minnesota, would improve the step therapy protocols by establishing a review process, um, such as the clinical review guidelines that are based on sound clinical practice, um, ensuring an exception process, again, much like Minnesota, and then requiring health insurers to respond quickly to exceptions requests. In this case, it would be 72 hours in non-emergency situations and 24 hours in emergency situations. Uh, this legislation uh, is, as I said, currently in the United States House of Representatives. We are working to identify United States Senate sponsor and uh, look for introduction in coming months soon. Um, in the House, it was introduced by um, 
Congressman Raul Ruiz, a Democrat out of California, and um, Representative Brad Wenstrup, a Republican out of Ohio. So it is bipartisan. It currently has north of 50 co-sponsors. I think we're at 56. Um, and uh, if you would like more information, I'm ha we um, help lead that coalition at a federal level. So I'm, ha I'm happy to put you in touch if you are willing to reach out to your federal member of Congress and encourage them to come on to the legislation. They will be home during the summer and would highly encourage you to do that um, to make sure that we have wraparound patient protections for the practice of uh, step therapy. And I'm happy to take any questions on that and pause for additional questions. So one question is if you guys could talk a bit about sort of best steps for patients to take if they're working through the appeals process. We talked about kind of how providers can best fill out the appeal, but if you're a patient in this position, is there any advice that you would offer? That's a really great question. Um, I'll go first to Dr. Smith, as, as yeah. he probably works more with patients. Yeah. Um I think, I think it first starts off with a conversation with your treating doctor. Um, sometimes uh, the recommendations of what to treat are, are reasonable. Um, and I will say that not all the time have I found the, the requisite steps to be overly burdensome. Um, and so I think it first starts off with, with a conversation of, do we think this makes sense for us? Um, as I had mentioned, you know, with, with particular types of epilepsy, sometimes it's not totally clear what the next one is. and um, and I will be, I mean, I'll be frank and clear when I say this is absolutely ridiculous. And uh, that's that's my responsibility to communicate that uh, with the provider, sorry, with the, with the payer. Um, but I think it first starts off with, is this fight worth it? Um, if it is, then I think it's a two-pronged um, attack that uh, a lot of the argument has to come uh, from our office partially. Um, but those, those patient phone calls make a big, big difference. I can tell you that uh, there have been it, it, that, this is not just for step therapy. This is for um, every every time you get a denied medication, you call enough times, um, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And I have seen plenty of, of instances where uh, the, the medication, I cannot get approved by anyone, but I, I know that that family is calling every single day and speaking to, to some representative. And uh, eventually they just cave and say, this isn't worth it. And, um, and, they'll, and they'll, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll clear the drug at that point. Um, and so, you know, I mean, ultimately that decision whether or not it's worth it is, is again, that's kind of the first first step for it. Um, and and I will I will say that the, the instances where where it has been necessary, I, I've been going to bat um, as well. Um, but I, I will have I have found plenty of times where uh, even when I wasn't the one pushing, the patients have been successful in lobbying uh, their payer. Um, and uh, who they were contacting with, and I, I, I'm not entirely certain who, like who specifically, if they had a particular uh, avenue of success. So I can't, I can't give a more detailed answer other than call your, call your provider. Dan, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I think Dr. Spencer brings up some really good points that you know, you know, we live in an age where patients really need to take control of, um, you know, what what happens between them and their health plans and building that relationship with their provider to kind of work in tandem to get around some of these hurdles. And that was the whole reason for this, this legislation was that to push the scale back towards uh, providers and patients to have a greater say in, in their treatment. Um, you know, this, that being said though, that, um, you know, also the goal of this legislation was to not create a burdensome process uh, for patients and providers to fight through this. And that if that's taking place, then um, then we need to know that so we can make changes. And you know, the health health plans are not only supposed to be following the letter of the law, but there's also a certain intent that they're supposed to be following. And and if they're not doing that, then we need to go back to the state legislature and uh, make some changes. I think those those are wonderful points. I would also add that this is a really great role, uh, regardless of the chronic or, or progressive condition that you face as a patient for you to engage with your respective organization um, and specifically their advocacy program or their health education program to make them aware of what you're facing um, and that uh, please don't be shy about you know reaching out to your state lawmaker as well and letting them know um, what you are facing as it relates to step therapy. Um, you know, we did work um, to, to 
put this law in place. Um, ultimately, it was the legislature that voted on this, and so um, you know there is there is some oversight. Um, so all parties want to know how it's working. If we need to look at some tweaks to make it work better. Uh, so that patients and providers in Minnesota can do its best uh, to get folks well and, and back to work and, and facing a normal life. Julia, are there other questions? Yeah, someone's wondering if they have health insurance through their work, if this applies to them. Um, in many respects, it will depend on uh, which insurer um, it is, and if you work for a large employer or a small employer, so I'd say probably your first um, your first step is to re reach out to your HR department and um, learn kind of how that state plan is or how, learn how that plan is regulated, um, or do some investigatory work on your own uh, with your insurance company to find out if they're state regulated or federally re regulated. If they are a state regulated program or you are insured through a public option like or Minsure or Minnesota Care or whatever it is, um, you will be subject to the patient protections and step therapy. If it is a federally insured product, um, so uh, by in many instances, a larger employer, um, that will more than likely be regulated by an ERISA or a federally regulated product and not currently subject to the patient protections. There are no other questions at this time. Well, before we close out, I will open the floor to uh, Dr. Smith and to Dan Andreessen uh, for any additional comments that they would like to make. I just want to say th thanks for for participating. Thanks for inviting me. Um, uh, it's it's uh, it's nice that uh, we get the opportunity sometimes to share what we're actually experiencing uh, on the ground floor. And I think next time we do this, I might invite the the back office staff that that handle these requests because uh, the the specifics really they are uh, the experts on. But uh, but thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks everyone for being here and. Um, I'll learn a little bit more about this process. And again, if if this process is not working for you and, and the patients that you're treating are not getting timely access to that medication, that was not the intent of this legislation. Um, and uh, reach out to a patient group that you're affiliated with or uh, find one who does, such as you know ourselves, as Rises Foundation, the Epilepsy Foundation. There's been several others working on this. Um, you know, Let us know because uh, these are things that we uh, want to change at the state legislature if we have to. Well, again, I would like to thank uh, Dan Andreessen of the National Multiple Sclerosis Society and Dr. Douglas Smith of the Minnesota Epilepsy Group uh, for their time and participation today. We couldn't do it without you. Um, and I will see if we have any additional questions before I close this out. We still do not have any questions. Oh, wonderful. Um, well, so for our providers, uh, you will have a link to uh, apply for your CME credit. And then for everyone else following uh, the presentation, you will receive a survey both on the screen and potentially via email afterwards. Um, I would encourage you to complete that survey. Uh, it will ask you some questions. We will keep the answers confidential, uh, but it is a, a venue for you to share any frustrations that you're having uh, with the current implementation of these patient protections um, and a way for us to learn more information so we can look at uh, any proposed remedies um, and wherever, if those are in the legislature and the Department of Commerce, kind of wherever, wherever it may exist. Um, and again, just thank you very much for your time and attention this afternoon. We greatly appreciate it and uh, enjoy the weekend. Thank you so much.